10 second security tip, go. Never stop learning. Too often, I meet security people who are not aware of current threats and technology. You don't need courses or degrees. Just meet with vendors and be active online. Even if your organization isn't changing its infrastructure, keep expanding your knowledge and attacking your weaknesses. That is half the fun of being in security. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. Joining me most always is Mike Johnson. We are available at CISOseries.com. We are also available on Reddit at the subreddit CISO series. And we're also available on Crowdcast, which is where we have our weekly CISO series video chats every Friday at 10 a.m. You can just find the link to that at CISOseries.com. Our sponsor for today's episode, a long-running sponsor. We greatly appreciate them. It is Trend Micro. They are awesome. Thank you so much, Trend Micro. You're going to hear a little bit more about them later in the show. But first, Mike, we are in the summer months. I am desperately trying to figure out what to do with my kids. But one of the things that I did is I got my son, Jack, who just turned 10, into the game Civilization. Oh, wow. He's totally into it. I, I'm a big fan of these, what they call God games, if you will, mm-hmm. or strategy games. And uh, I was wondering, is there a game that you think is a good educational strategy game? Well, I like my games to be very escapism and very brainless. Personally, uh, I, I look at them as, as entertainment. Is it because you need, when you play a game, you need to flush your brain, essentially? Yes, that, that, that's exactly <laughs> it. It's, it's Okay, I, I've done enough thinking. I've done enough strategizing. I want to just run around and explore or, or what have you. That said, I've heard a lot about Minecraft. My 10-year-old son's also addicted to Minecraft. He watches endless videos about it. Well, there, there's a lot of courses around teaching programming using Minecraft. So there, there, yes. that might be the, the crossover between the game and, and the education. It, it is. Well, anything that has sort of building involved in it, I think there's an opportunity for education as well. Well, I would like to bring in our guest today. Our guest, you've heard his name many, many times on this podcast as he has been a heavy contributor of the What's Worst scenarios and other (laughs) stuff. We are going to throw a What's Worst scenario at him that is not written by him. I can't wait. But I got a chance to meet this gentleman in Tel Aviv, which was my second to last trip before the pandemic, unfortunately. But it's great to have him on. He is the CISO of Rapid. It is near Rothenburg. Near, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Why is everyone talking about this now? On LinkedIn, Farhan Khan, a recruiter at Cyber Apt Recruitment, told a tale of getting a call asking if he could help a company recruit a seasoned CISO for their 300 plus person company. He was excited until he found out that the salary that this company was going to offer for the CISO was in the range of about 90,000 to 105K. Now, Mike, we've talked about unrealistic CISO salaries before, but Mm -hmm. this is actually below the rate of entry-level cyber positions in the Bay Area. I'm assuming that you've had these uncomfortable moments and you get out politely, but do you ever say that's an unrealistic expectation for a CISO when when someone offers you something like that? And do you let someone else explain that to them? Like you, it's like, "Eh, it's not for me to get involved. What do you do? I'm really shocked at the salary range. The first thing I go to is maybe this wasn't in the Bay Area. Oh, it's not in the Bay Area. No, I should qualify. It's not, but I was just I was comparing it to the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, I, I even wonder if it's like public sector, which we've seen. We we saw one with Santa Barbara, CISO Santa Barbara, for like I think one hundred and thirty or one hundred and sixty k. Yeah, something and they, like that. They have these weird structures in public sector that basically puts these roles in very explicit bands. Mm-hmm. And they have no, they don't really have wiggle room in that. And I think that's part of why we see these really low public sector salaries for CISOs. To your question, when I have come across these, I, I can't recall that I've been in the case where it's been someone looking to have a conversation with me about a role. But they just talked about in general, like, hey, we're looking to hire a CISO and this is what we got. Right. And do you politely say, uh, maybe not? 
no, I, I will, I will, I'll give them some guidance. It's kind of in my nature to try and help. But, you know, I am going to point out that, hey, at, at that salary, you're unlikely to hire a seasoned CISO. Maybe you can find a first timer, but that, that word seasoned changes everything. That, I think, is really what the, the challenge that they're going to face. And then I'm also going to point out to them that the other problem you're going to have hiring a CISO is they're going to look at this go and think they're not going to be able to hire anyone on their team. And so they're going to struggle with building a security program when the company is paying this low for security leaders. Now, I want to bring in a, a comment that Davi Ottenheimer of Interrupt brought up. And he's the one who uh, brought this story to my attention. And Nero, I want your take on it. He said that high CISO salaries are just attracting fraudsters. Now, do you agree? And if so, what would a company have to be wary of, Nir? Well, uh, you're talking to somebody who has imposter syndrome. So, you know, I, <laughs> I felt like a fraudster half of my career. <laughs> so maybe Davi is right. I know a lot of CISOs who you're just a security guy and suddenly you're the CISO and you're like, wait a second, should I be here? Should I be here? So maybe he has a point there. But I think that uh, it's just incompetence. It's just two sides of the same coin. And that's Davi's point. What's the difference between an organization that uh, is so disconnected from reality that they think they can pay a CISO, a season CISO, no less, that's supposed to protect the company so low? So, you know, a company like that could probably get a fraudster as well. Maybe even the VPHR in that company is a fraudster. So, uh, you know, he's trying to throw out these these numbers. I don't think, though, that Davi has a, has a point. I don't think it's any different than any other hiring. It just shows that, that maybe as, as somebody who's looking for a job, stay away from that company because they don't know how to hire. I think Davi has a point in this respect. And I, I, I'm interested, quick response from both of you on any of that, because the security role is so confusing to people who are not in cybersecurity. That is, I feel that it might be open to fraud. What do you think, Mike? So I hadn't thought about it that way, that where you have two sides of a conversation where you've got someone who really is uneducated in an area and another person who's highly educated in that area, the one who's more educated is going to have the more power in the conversation. And right. if they then have low morals, then there certainly is the possibility that they're going to be able to snow job the person who's doing the hiring who has no idea. There's like, I, I've been told I need to hire a CISO. I don't know what a CISO is. I don't know what they do. You're a slick talker. I'm going to give you a hire. So there certainly is that possibility. I will say I haven't met any of those CISOs. I have every CISO that I've met that I've known they know what they're doing. They have a high moral standard, and they're not gonna they're not gonna put themselves in this situation. So, is it a possibility? A absolutely. But you haven't run into it. I haven't run into it. But we've certainly seen even fraudulent CFOs um, hired in a company. So it's a possibility. I worked with one. Oh. <laughs> Near just quickly, have you ever seen it? What a, fr a fraudulent CISO? Yes. yes. So uh, uh, I've seen incompetent CISOs, but I've seen just like, as Mike said, incompetent CFOs, COOs, you know, uh, I've seen them all. I work with a lot of startups and a lot of times, especially in Israel, we have a lot of startups and the founders are young guys. They don't always know what to hire and they can make this mistake in any role. That said, I, you know, the way you explain it, I see Davi's point. And, uh, you know, I've actually advised some startups and they said, listen, don't even get a CISO right now. Just start doing security by yourself or, or get a consultant. You don't have the budget. You don't have the time. You don't have the knowledge. Feel what security is and then go to hire a CISO. And then you can hire, make a much better hire. So in that sense, I agree with Davi. Mike's confused. Let's help him out. On previous shows, Mike, you have admitted you would not want to run the IT department. Now, I should point out, it's not that you were confused at this <laughs> point. You just didn't want to run the IT department. Mm -hmm. Now, Nir, the reason I'm bringing uh, this up like this is because you mentioned, we, we spoke earlier, that you feel that getting out of one's comfort zone is critical no matter what department you're in. So I, I'm going to ask, what are the, the pros and cons of other departments, not just being security aware, but taking on cybersecurity responsibilities. I mean, you, you gave me an example to the extreme of the CEO also being a CISO. And I'll ask also vice versa. Like, you know, what about cybersecurity taking on other department responsibilities? How, how far can and should it go? What do you think, Nir? 
Uh, so I think that basically uh, most CISOs, they have to solve problems. And one of the main problems is working with other people in the organization. You have to ally with IT. You have to ally, right. ally with DevOps. You've got to ally with a lot of people. Now, one form of dealing with this problem is being their boss because now they have to do what you say. So, you know, that's just an extreme solution. Does it always work? This isn't what's worse, so I can say it depends. Some organization is just going to ruin the organization. Some organization, usually smaller ones, it could work great. Sometimes these DevOps are, uh, hire the CISO, and uh, there's no reason why the CISO can't manage IT or manage DevOps. And as they grow, you know, he basically becomes maybe a CIO because he's now head of uh, security and IT, but he always looks at it from security glasses and security point of view. So is there a certain level you want? Like the example that I was saying earlier, and and, and I don't know if this still holds it because I remember that McDonald's had a policy that all executives had to work one day a month. I don't know if it was that much, but they had to work at some regular intervals at a local McDonald's restaurant to understand. Mike, is there sort of any level that you kind of do that with your security team and vice versa, having others, you know, taking on some levels of security responsibilities? I think that's a good example of a method or methodology around learning the business. We, we often mm -hmm. talk about CISOs needing to understand the business and how the business operates. And one way of doing that is just straight up do that job. Maybe you're taking calls at the call center one day out of a month. Maybe you are working on the financial numbers, hopefully with some checking going on behind you, um, <laughs> that, that you're, you're having these exposures to the rest of the business. My perspective and what I both personally do and, and have other folks in my team do is it's getting involved in the sales cycle. We're, we're getting involved. We get questions from customers on our security. So the more we understand what that process looks like, the better we can help the business, the better we can understand how security impacts the business. And that then both helps us grow, helps us get a little bit uncomfortable, but it, it also is going to help us understand the business and help us move the business forward. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Trend Micro. And here's Steve Prentice with more. In October of 2019, Trend Micro acquired Australia-based cloud security posture management firm Cloud Conformity. This was done to allow Trend Micro to take on the commonly overlooked security issues caused by cloud infrastructure misconfigurations. Here is Aaron Ansari. My name is Aaron Ansari, and I'm the Vice President of Cloud One Conformity for North America. Conformity is part of the Cloud One offering, and it is the cloud posture management component of Cloud One. And it's the global public authority on cloud infrastructure security and governance. It's multi cloud, and it gives visibility and compliance into corporations' presence in the public cloud. I asked Aaron, why this? Why now, when the cloud has been around for quite a while already? Is this a new approach? It's relatively new. Adoption of the public cloud really hasn't taken off until very recently. I think 2006 was when AWS was launched. It's been a while since public cloud has been available. However, adoption of public cloud by corporations has been slow. And so now, just in the past few years, um, adoption has increased and the complexity and the skills gap that is there to move and migrate to the cloud and adopt the public cloud is vast. Conformity fills this gap. For more information and to watch a great demo video of Conformity in action, visit trendmicro.com and look for the Conformity link. It's time to play What's Worse? Nir, I know I don't need to ask you if you know how to play What's Worse because <laughs> you are responsible for many What's Worse questions. As always, I'm going to make Mike answer first. Here's the question, Mike. It comes from Nick McNulty of Manulife, who's also given us many what's worse scenarios. And here it is. What is worse? A zero-day accelerated patching protocol that is so rigid that nobody takes any initiative during the response or one that's so amazingly flexible that there are different groups acting completely out of unison during the response. Which one is worse? 
Wow, this is an interesting one because you really have, when you're dealing with these zero day vulnerabilities, you often do have these very disparate opinions about what should happen. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the idea here, and and frankly, the idea in, in many organizations is, all right, well, let's write it down so that when we get there, when we get involved, when we've got it in front of us, we actually aren't shooting from the hip. We have some idea of what we're going to do when we're in this situation. And these are two examples of a, of a path that you can take. One is just leave it open that, hey, we need we need to patch. Let's, let's do it. Let's figure it out as we go. But we know, we agree that we need to do it. And then the other is you have to do it. Here's how you do it. There's no question. There's nothing between the lines you have no options and no, no, it depends in that world. And I would actually say, given these two options, as painful as it is, I would prefer to have the rigidity. I would prefer to have that we, we know what we're going to do. If we have to do some encouragement as a security team, if we have to push for that initiative in other teams, so be it. But I would rather have an idea of what we're going to do and what we should expect versus, oh my gosh, we've got a new O'Day. This is how we handled it last time. All these teams went out separate. And you're likely going to end up in a scenario where it's not going to actually be patched in any reasonable period of time. And if it's truly that black swan of this is going to result in a compromise, then the company is in a bad place. So I, I think the... Lucy Goosey is, is the worst one in this case. All right, Nir, I throw it to you. Do you agree or disagree with Mike? First off, I disagree with Mike just because you like that. I always <laughs> like that. Good. Let's hear your reasoning. But I also have reasoning. But before that, I want to tell Nick that uh, I hope I'll get him back. I hope he's a guest and uh, you give him one of my questions. <laughs> so uh, I disagree because, again, this is based on my experience. Once you have a, a rigid kind of, especially if it, if it hurts, if it hurts the business, then they're just going to push it off. It's not that bad. We'll wait. And, you know, I've seen this, let's say WannaCry is a great example. Or, and, you know, when everybody had to patch and it was just a nightmare because you just have to deploy the Windows patch. It, it just, and it didn't work. There just people didn't patch and we couldn't get it across. And, you know, the whole world was getting ransomware and uh, my organization was, was suffering. So I would rather uh, be able to have flexibility. And just like Mike said, we work in an it depends world. We work in an it depends world. So basically, you know, I, I would focus on, you know, maybe my gateway, maybe what's what's most internet facing and, and be super forceful there. And then maybe with my users or other things, I can hold back. So I, I kind of like the flexibility here. Focus my efforts because if it's a big organization, if it's complex, I'm not going to be able to patch the whole organization at once. In these kind of organizations, the CISO, a lot of times is not that strong. So, you know, you have to pick your battles. So I'll pick my important battles and then I'll, I'll circle back. Now, is there a risk here? Yes, of course, because you didn't deploy patches everywhere. You might get attacked where you didn't. But, you know, that's a risk I'm willing to take over. Uh, you know, it's too rigid. Now I have to convince everybody at once. We've got listeners, and they've got questions. We have a question from Anya Spielman of Swiss Golf Partners. Here, let's hear it. Hi there. I'm a big fan of the show, and I really like the advice that you give to vendors and what you would like to see in the pitches. Um, Now, I'm a recruiter, and I specialize in cybersecurity recruitment, and I know in the end of the show, um, everyone always said that they're hiring. However, I find it quite difficult to get traction from CISOs. So I just wanted to see what would be your advice and what do you want to see in those sort of initial emails or LinkedIn messages. Thank you. All right. I will start with you, Mike. How could a recruiter, an outside recruiter, approach you appropriately? and that you would be receptive to hearing from them? I think this is a very much uphill battle. All of the companies that I've worked for, we've had our own in-house recruiters. And there's a lot of incentive to use and leverage our in-house recruiters. And I think in the security space, part of the skepticism is we're still such a new industry that it's hard for recruiters to understand what a skilled professional looks like versus not. So we're we're kind of anticipating that we're still going to have to do a lot of work on our part. 
again, because of how new our profession is. I think this is something that over time, Anya and, and her peers, we will be more open to using outside recruiters, much like the IT world is now today. I just think right now we're still a little bit too young. It's still difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff in order to do this recruiting. So I, I, for, from my perspective, I'm not sure that there really is something that can be said. But maybe take a look at companies who don't have in-house recruiters. Start there. Build a client list. Build some experience. Build some examples that you can point to. And then you have something that is a stronger message that you can try taking to, to the folks who do have the in-house recruiters. Near, what's your take? I mean, is it an uphill battle in most cases if, if they have in-house staff? Mike is completely right. I hire quite a lot and uh, I get recruiters approaching me on LinkedIn and, you know, they're super compelling and, and and they sound like they have good candidates, but I just, there's nothing I can do. If I don't personally know the candidate or I got it recommend, recommended by somebody I can vouch for that I really trust his opinion, I'm just not going to take the risk. I'm going to take them through the regular uh, process, you know, speaking about fraudsters and all that stuff. They, you know, there's a, there's a process. They start by HR and, uh, you know, once they, they, they pass that, then they come to me. So, uh, you know, there's just no, nothing I can do about it. Now, is there any hope for Anya here? Yeah, her only hope is to uh, rethink her strategy of turning to CISOs and just focus on the HR folks. And, uh, you know, maybe her question should be, who should I talk to? You know, because obviously Anya wants to help us. We, we want help hiring good people. And, uh, you know, maybe we can facilitate her helping us. But we can't work with her directly a lot of times in most organizations that I've seen. It's just, it's architecturally within the organization, like hands are tied. And, you know, we've run into this problem, not in specifically recruitment, Mike, but I'm just thinking about, I'm trying to remember, it was, uh, Dennis Lieber, it was a long time ago, we had him on. Dennis said, you could literally write me the perfect pitch, or I could write to you what the perfect pitch is to me. I still can't get it through my system because of the way the procurement works in government. So, you know, a lot of times, whether you're a recruiter or a vendor, it seems that even if you're doing everything right, you just may be on a losing end of uh, an effort. Yes, Mike? Yeah, sometimes the, the deck is just stacked against you and you really just don't have a chance. However, there are tons of companies. There are tons of security openings. One prospect just might not be the right one and focus your efforts somewhere else and you know, you'll find other opportunities. It just might be that there's some that you're just never going to get and you should just move on from those. I've hired through recruiters, Rapid's hiring through recruiters, but they don't come through me. You know, uh, I don't even have the budget for to pay the recruiter. So they would go to the HR and if they're good, they'd come to me and I'd hire them. I have nothing against recruiters. It just, it's, it's like asking me to buy, I don't know, the coffee for the office. I'm just not the right guy. You know, I love coffee, I drink it all the time. <laughs> not the right guy for that. Um, is this a good idea? So I recently published an article on the CISO series entitled 25 API Security Tips You're Probably Not Considering. And the very first tip from Gary Hayslip, the CISO of SoftBank Investment Advisors and a frequent guest on the show, his tip was the good old-fashioned kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Now, I made that tip number one, and then I had 24 more tips, which is, <laughs> you know, to deploy, you know, if you were to deploy all 24 of them, it no longer would be simple. So KISS sounds great in theory. I'm going to start with you, Nir. But how the heck do you pull it off in practice? Can you point to an example of how you took something that was complicated and simplified it? Yeah, sure. So the classic example is a single sign-on SSO, mm -hmm. where basically yeah, every authentication is different. You got a lot of sources of truth for authentication, and then you use just you know your your one source, and it's uh, you sign up with the same user, and you know it's basically passwordless, just single sign-on for everything. Users love it. Security teams love it. It's much easier to provision and to control that. That's just a classic example as far as IT and security. As far as API. 
you know, uh, Rapid is an API company. We started the company with SSO. I mean, I didn't start the company, unfortunately, but uh, the founders did. And also our API is security. And the security is really, again, based on the KISS principle, the first principle. When you start that, and you do that by, first off, having a single entry point, which is usually a reverse proxy. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of APIs that have a lot of endpoints and, and you can enter uh, through a lot of points and you know, and sometimes you're not even in separate data centers and it gets very, very complex. Today, a lot, a lot also with cloud, it's, it's simpler to do just a single point of entry. And that makes it simple because you only have one entry point. It's, it, it makes it simple and it starts to disperse. Another thing that we do is make the the endpoints in the API, the API endpoints as similar as possible. I mean, the same operating system, mm-hmm. usually they're centrally managed. It's very, very simple. So let's say there's a patch, you patch it once, it, it, it goes to all, it's centrally patched and all the endpoints, yeah, you can expect the behavior from the patch. It just makes it uh, simple. So this rule is, is really the golden rule. And uh, you know anybody who's doing API security is probably really, really fighting for this rule. So it's good that it's number one for you, David, because it's true. All right, Mike, I ask you, or is your security based on KISS? When I think about this question and, and I think about KISS as an answer, I think about foundations. You know, we, mm-hmm. we talk about it a lot on the show and keep coming back to the idea that you're building on top of something else, that you can keep your overall strategy, your implementation simple if you're leveraging reusable components. If you're starting with say, an inventory, it makes your vulnerability management that much easier. So when I, when I think KISS, that's where I go to uh, is foundations. But listening to Nier really triggered a thought to me that there's two sides of simplicity. There is like actual simplicity and then there's perceived simplicity. Behind the scenes, SSO is actually really difficult. It's really complex. It's quite often a pain to implement, but to the users, it's perceived as simple. It's making their lives easier. And I think one of the good things for us to keep in mind is as we're building controls, as we're implementing new technologies, new ideas, we need to think about the users. And with APIs, you're thinking about developers. So ensuring that it's easy to adopt the security mechanisms that you're building into your APIs, into your API systems, making sure that's easy for developers that right there is keeping it simple. I agree. It's, you know, it's just an SSO project is a major project, Mike. But uh, ultimately, I see with my team managing it afterwards, managing the, the connections just becomes so much more simple. And if Absolutely. you work in an organization that you are so in that sense, it's taking something complex, doing something really complex to make it simple. Maybe that's how I should say it. Ah, good way to wrap it up. Thank you very much, Nir. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Let me also thank our uh, sponsor, Trend Micro, who I've thanked many times on the show, and so I'll thank them again. Thank you very much for supporting us. You know, they're available at trendmicro.com. But do people, by the way, type in web addresses or just go to Google? I I found that the web addresses have become kind of passe now, and everyone just types things into Google. Anyways, Nir, specifically, I want to thank you for all the amazing What's Worse scenarios. You give us really good ones. Second, willing to play somebody else's What's Worse <laughs> scenario. And the the segment that really you brought to me that I really loved was the whole idea of, of us getting out of our comfort zones and essentially doing other responsibilities in the company to sort of understand the business because we talk about this all the time but the physical act of doing something as we know you learn a lot better so thank you very much for bringing all that i let you have the last word but mike you first near thanks for joining us I, I i i was really excited when i saw your name on the list because i was thinking yes finally he has to answer one of these <laughs> And so, so that you know, I I really want to just echo what what David said was, thank you for willing to be a good sport to see what it's like on the other side of these difficult questions that that you've been asking. Um, be able to thank you in person for all of these contributions, for everything that you've done to kind of help us out, to contribute to the show, to to help enlighten and entertain our audience uh, through these questions that you've been asking. So, thank you for the questions. Thank you for being willing to answer one. And thank you for all of your contributions. All right. And Nir, we always ask if you're hiring, so please tell us that. And two, any plug you'd like to make, make a plug for Rapid, too. And spell it for people. It's R-A-P-Y-D dot net, correct? 
Yeah, exactly. RAPYD.net. Rapid is uh, changing uh, payments. If you're into payments, if you're interested in where fintech is going, if you want to see what's going to happen in the future in payments with COVID-19 and all that stuff going on, check out Rapid, making a lot of waves in the fintech world. I was hiring, but because of this situation, this crazy situation in the world, we're in kind of a wait and see. So hopefully, you know, uh, we're, we're seeing that in some cases it's not as bad as we thought. But So hopefully my uh, positions will be open again. But, you know, usually I'm hiring. I'm hiring for a number of positions. Uh, look for that in Rapid's website. I'd like to thank uh, you guys. I contribute because I listen. And uh, your podcast is truly, in, my, in the last few years, been like a cheat sheet. You know, sometimes <laughs> if you talk about something and then, you know, there's a, you know, you just sound a little smarter, a little more articulate. You see, you know, you just, uh, you just take Mike's job. Johnson swag. You stand in a, in a meeting. You sound like a, you sound like the CISO of uh, Lyft or Fastly. It's it's always great. So th- thank you, Mike, for you know I'm not I don't credit you in meetings, but uh, I'll credit you now. And for all the listeners who you know were ever gonna be on this podcast, here's a little trick for what's worse. Listen to the question. If you have an answer, say it. If you don't, just agree with Mike. You know he goes first. He breaks it down. Then you just can just say yeah I agree with Mike, and you just give like a little reason, and usually that's good. If if you listen carefully. Some guests do that and i was gonna do, i was totally gonna do that but uh, at the end of the day i thought like i should disagree so i ended up doing that. so thank you for having me and uh and i'll keep listening that's good now I, I must say that a lot of the guests who do agree with you don't agree with your reasoning though which i always appreciate too so at least there's Absolutely. some level of disagreement there <laughs> so thank you so much for all of that, Nir. That was fantastic. Uh, and I got to thank the audience as well. I mean, they're phenomenal contributors to this podcast, and you have been one of them. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for participating and listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.